welcome to Working Title. For the next 25 minutes, you'll be watching 10 budding young Victorian filmmakers from various cultural and religious backgrounds write, direct, shoot and produce two short films of their own. These young adults from various faiths and cultures were recruited, trained and mentored by industry professionals over a period of three months to create two short films which will air on Channel 31. We'll be following their attempt at making television and we'll also delve deeper into the process by asking them some questions about their vision and their experience. Join us as we follow them on the journey which has resulted in the two films that we'll shortly screen. So let's hear from these talented filmmakers and find out a little bit more about their experience. I'm Ritika. I'm Sumetta. I'm Natalie. I'm John Vassil. I'm Priyanka. Working Title is a pretty interesting experience, so what attracted you to being a part of it? Um, what attracted me was the opportunity to learn about documentary making and learn the technical aspects of filmmaking um, and to be taught by industry professionals. Great. Um, for me, I just came straight out of high school and I wanted to meet people that were interested in the same things that I was interested in. So I think that this would be a great forum for that to happen. Right. Natalie? It's basically the same thing. I, um, I was always finding excuses why I couldn't start uh, learning how to make documentaries yet, didn't know any of the technical side of things. Um, and this was a great way to get some training, learn the basics and meet people that were also interested in the same things. Great. Right, right, well, uh, for me, I guess it was because I've never done filmmaking before, for now, that is. And, well, it's a very nice way to meet various young individuals. Um, it's basically the same as Rithika. Um, I just wanted to get some more experience on the technical aspects of filmmaking and also have the opportunity to use like the equipment and make um, our own documentary. Great, thanks guys. And you know, something that's quite topical these days is just some of the challenges that young diverse people face. Do you think there's any particular issues that, that you as, as, as young ethnic people, I guess, face in being a part of the media? Um, I think there are definitely challenges, um, but because Australia is a multicultural society, I think um, every day we're getting closer to having those challenges broken down, but I think there would be challenges. It would be a lie to say there weren't. I think it's really basically the same thing as what you've said, Radika. I think it's a really important um, thing to have um, like brown faces on TV. I think it's a very humbling thing when myself, I see people from different backgrounds on television. I think it's a really important aspect of the media because Australia is such a multicultural nation. Um, so I think it's a quite a natural, um, great way to put brown voices, ethnic voices, non-white voices out there. Um, so you've all touched on your experience and some of the reasons why you chose to be involved with Working Title. So are there any particular skills or experiences that you, that you really value from being a part of this? Um, I think the one experience I really value from this project is meeting other young people who are interested in making documentaries and also um, through the interviews we did for our documentary, just hearing people's stories, I think that's been a really valuable experience for me. For me, um, definitely the technical side of things. I did not have the first idea how to use the camera properly, sound, editing in particular. Um, they're all skills that I really needed to learn and at least now I feel as though I have the foundation mm -hmm. in those to kind of go on and work on more projects and develop further. It's also been this group of people and the way things have come together um, from the beginning where you thought, what are we going to come up with? What are we going to end up with uh, when this project finishes? And um, I'm really quite proud of what we've been able to put together. Um, for me it's a technical aspect as well, um, like I did a bit of filmmaking at uni but this just reinforced everything I, I had learnt but also I had not never really taken part in the editing process and so like editing for us was like a bit of a challenge because we'd never really done it before but 
we learnt so much and you learn how creative you can be post-production, which is really interesting. And um, I was also, I mean, this gives us a really good platform, you know, to present something that means something to us or, you know, we, it's, it's made it a lot easier, yeah. Thanks for those honest and really insightful answers, guys. The crew of the working title split into two groups. Each worked on and produced their very own short documentary. Don't go anywhere because we'll be right back after the break with the premiere of the first film titled Food of Colour. Welcome back. As part of the working title journey, three of our participants worked on a topic close to their heart and we have two of them with us here today. Cultural and religious acceptance is a topic that's being increasingly covered in the media today. But you girls have gone about this topic in a rather unconventional way. So can you tell us a little bit, a bit more about your response to this subject and where the idea of food of colour came from? Sure. Well, um, we wanted to really represent um, the fact that Melbourne and Australia as a whole is a multicultural society, but we decided to make the focus of our documentary food because we see that as a really unifying element, um, food as something that has the power to bring people together regardless of cultural or ethnic or religious backgrounds and also it's, it's a unifying feature regardless of what culture you look at so we chose to make our documentary about multicultural food in Melbourne. We all come from different communities. Um, myself, I went to a school in Footscray and you see a Vietnamese restaurant next to an Ethiopian one next to a Greek one. It's very much culturally diverse and so I guess we just wanted to show that show that diversity that's that you don't really see on Australian TV. Let's have a look at our first film, Food of Colour. My name is Hossam Afioni. I'm pastry chef in this shop. I was born in Lebanon, Tripoli. I came here when I was uh, 15 and uh, that was back in 1990. My name is Abarra Ayalew. The restaurant name is Cafe Lalibala. I own this restaurant with my wife. My wife's name is Salam Oitwondamu and uh, she is the owner, I am the manager of the restaurant. Food screen is multicultural people, or not only Ethiopian people, all African people, especially Sudanese, Somali, and West African, and a lot of African people living in this area. Because of that, I like only North African people, I like all multicultural people. In Australia, I did a different job. First, I drive, uh, I was a working factory for four and a half years, I to drive taxi for five and a half years. After that, I opened this restaurant. I think everybody will be a little bit worried about opening a new business. But, you know, we gave it um, a try and it worked. First, it did not, you know, sell as we sell it now. But we, we were patient and uh, we succeeded. I was born in Venezuela. I've been here for three and a half years and about a year and five weeks ago we started Cruzado de Papa. I'm one of the owners. We are Epa, which is a jewel of Venezuelan food and it's something that we grow up eating on a daily basis no matter what um, political, social or religious uh, tendency you could belong to um, everyone grows up on arepas. The way I grew up the table is the place where everything comes together and at least once a week the extended family will sit around a table and that's where everyone catches up with everyone. My name is Dushay Tsemma uh, my restaurant name is Harambe. My uh, African people, uh, most of them hanging around here. So Footscray, uh, known by the African community surrounding it. That is why I opened the restaurant to, in, to introduce my food for all of Australians and all uh, people from the, around the world. Daytime is more our people, nighttime and most of the time Australian people and a lot of Afri African people and 
uh, with, uh, from Europe, from India, from Asia. A lot of people try the food. Most of the people doesn't know it by hand food, or most of the people ask me knife and fork, but uh, I said for my culture is you eat all my hand, because of that I, I tell for the people how to the food, and I'm happy. And the first time the people is coming for specially, I'm happy. I just look the, how to the hotel the food. I'm a black man. All these things are, looks like Africa. They love it. They love it, they come and they use it. Uh, especially I, I ask people to not use spoon and fork because our way of eating is in our finger so that even when I'm asking them to do so, they don't mind, they do it. You don't have to go to Latin America now. We can take you here, you can have dinner with us, you can listen to the music. We had a, a great group last night of 12 people and there were two Australians, one Spaniard, one Brazilian, two Malaysians, one Chinese, and a Colombian lady who brought them all in. Her mission was to bring them here because she wanted them to experience Latin America. Uh, especially it's um, uh, Lebanese uh, customers. Uh, then in general we have those Middle Eastern customers from Syria, from uh, uh, Egypt, from Jordan from all different Arabic countries. We have a lot of customers that are living here, like Australian. Uh, they like the sweets and they give us a very nice feedback. We have always new customers, which we are happy to have always, you know. Everything that um, uh, tells you that you, your work is good, okay, makes you happy. If you enjoy your work, you're happy with it, you love it, you'll do something for your life to enjoy it, not for the money in the end. Food is, is, is definitely a good excuse for a bunch of people to sit in the same place at the same time and then we'll see what happens. Well done guys. So viewers from Melbourne and Geelong have just seen your first go at making a short film. So how does, it, how does it feel that tens of thousands of people have just shared this experience with you? Um, it feels really good. To be honest, we hadn't really thought about um, the fact that it would be shown. We were just so involved in the process of making it. But I guess it's good. It feels sort of like a first step. So you've mentioned um, filming a, many <coughs> iconic Melbourne restaurants. So how did it feel to be a part of the behind the scenes experience of what happens at a restaurant? I think one thing that we've both kind of realised is how much of a brave act it is mm. starting up um, a restaurant because these are foods just like the Ethiopian, Ethiopian restaurants in Footscray. It's such a brave act in the sense that these recipes come from many traditions there ago you know they're very um they're very long lines of recipes have been handed down and as um abara says with the recipes his auntie taught them to him his grandma taught them to him so it's it's a very um it's a very hard thing to do and i think it's really enlightened us in that sense because mostly we just kind of view ourselves as consumers of the food but I think it's a, quite an interactive process going into someone's restaurant and realising all of these long lines of traditions behind it. Now it's time to have a look at our second group and their very interesting and intriguing film called Heart. Stick around and we'll be right back after this short break. Here we are with our second group of young people who took part in Working Title. After great discussion, this group came up with a rather bizarre but interesting topic that most people have never heard of. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about this chosen topic and how you came up with it? Um, well, for us it started out as uh, an interest in what seemed like this really strange medical condition called Stendhal Syndrome, which is basically um, when an individual becomes overwhelmed when they're exposed to art. Um, whether it's a particularly large scale or just really beautiful art, they can experience physical symptoms such as um, dizziness, uh, heart palpitations, even fainting. 
So um, from that point, we initially tried to uh, see if we could actually contact anyone that had suffered from it. Um, but when that kind of didn't become possible, we modified our topic and it became more simply an exploration into the effect and the impact that art in whatever form can have on individuals. Uh, we wanted to to film something else, something something different, something more interesting than than is all these other ordinary topics. Um, so standout syndrome, it's exactly like Natalie said, it's it's a, a physical reaction of the body by exposure to really beautiful art pieces. It doesn't have to be art; it can be just be beautiful nature around us, beautiful environments. Um, as it's already been said, um, it, it did start off with stent halls, and I think we still, I mean, we're still focusing on it. However, stent halls is like one end of the spectrum when it can be really like the extreme effects where, you know, we read an article where a woman was even hallucinating, and it was challenging because most of the people who suffer it suffer it overseas in Europe, so it was hard for us to find. So then we modified it in the sense that it became about how art does impact on us but not to the point where we faint and hallucinate. We still have the possibility of having an emotional connection or reaction to the art. So, um, yeah, I think that's what we wanted to explore. And Now it's time to have a look at heart. My name's Angela Foote and I'm the director of Hawthorne Studio and Gallery. Until um, I was introduced to this program, I'd never heard of the Stanhall Syndrome, um, but I understand how it actually does um, affect uh, people. I find in the gallery that I have a lot of people that come in and get impacted by the art, uh, sometimes positively and negatively. We have certain exhibitions, not unlike the painting behind me of Gary Miles, also with Greg Irvine, where the art is unbelievably vibrant and colourful and has a lot of energy to it. And with that, a lot of the people pick up on that energy and feel uplifted and happy by the time they've left the exhibition. So without a doubt, um, being surrounded by um, bright work or work that has a strong use of colour or a positive energy does um, impact on me as well um, in the gallery. Um, likewise, um, certain other works that are very monotone in colour, you know, all the work that I choose at the gallery, I have a special feeling for, but um, yeah, there are some works that by the end of the day, it doesn't have that same energy to me. And, Yes, I'm ready, you know, at the end of the day to close the door and looking at the time at five o'clock to head out the door. So um, it was nothing I was conscious until I actually became a director of a gallery and uh, curated exhibitions. I'm Gary Miles and I'm a Gippsland artist and uh, I've got my own studio up here just out of Druin. Um, I very seldom judge my work. I say it's a strong painting or a weaker painting. It's a whole uh, um, line, squiggle, mark type thing. And uh, like Fred Williams stated once to, you know, it's like a, it's like a language, a, a language in paint. And that's what you try and discover within yourself, I think, to actually make these marks. So if you watch what's around you, smell the breeze and observe, I think an artist actually watches that a lot. You get paintings in a restaurant, one big painting, and everyone's sitting there, they've been subconsciously, subconsciously absorbing that work. Whether they like it or not, um, they'll get a lot of energy, or they won't, or some, uh, but you walk out and if you're not aware of it, you're feeling pretty damn happy. My name's Philip Hunter, I'm a physiotherapist. I could really understand what Stendhal was talking about when, he, when they, they came up with the syndrome. Not that I would call it a syndrome, I just think it's a, a, a re reaction, a response to, to a high energy uh, environment that you're not used to. 
if I'm feeling really good, and I and I say if I was an artist, which I'm not at all, can't even do stick figures, but if I was, and if and if I had a, a really high level of um, evolution in my own physical presence, so I had a I, I was a high energy person, and I painted a, a painting that I was really happy with, um, that I knew what I was I was trying to get these emotions down on, on the paper. Um, then the energy that I used to create that artwork is actually inside of the artwork. So the, art, the artwork itself will resonate with that frequency of energy. The feeling of that energy can overwhelm us in some way because the frequency of energy of that particular painting is, is high and our frequency is lower. So we, if, we, if, we, if we're trying to, to emulate that and, under, and appreciate that art, artwork, we will feel better. Like music from the like ghetto churches in in America to now you have the rap movements. Uh, it, it inspires a lot of people. I don't know. I believe like I don't know how to say it. But... Instinctively, you do. And that's the same if you go to like the galleries. There's quite a lot of fake, unreal stuff. Yeah. But when you know something is real. Sometimes you cry, sometimes you just hide that you're crying. To be able to come from the heart with your work and come out and present real, real things to the community, that's, a, that's something that I believe we get right here. Mm. I can't explain it. It's a soul thing. It's a thing that, you know, you just get a really good feeling about. And when you have that with a piece of artwork, it will have that for you with, for the whole time, wherever. Well, that's certainly an amazing story. How did you find the story and how did you go about researching it? Um, well, it started with a, uh, the gallery owner, Angela. Um, through speaking to her, we actually uh, got in contact with Philip Hunter, the physiotherapist. And um, yeah, so things kind of began to flow um, bit by bit. So, were there any surprises along the way? Surprises? Um, as we, on the first day of editing, when we uploaded all the footage, uh, we realised that we had lost one of the three main interviews for the project. Uh, so we searched through the computer, searched through the tapes and nowhere to be found. Yeah, we had no choice but to go and film it again and um, that was hard. I mean, we had to make do, but it was a good experience, I guess, as well, learning that when, you know, to avoid these situations in the future, but if they do arise, how do you efficiently deal with them? You don't sort of have a big mental breakdown, but you say, okay, well, that's all right. We'll just go and do it again and make do with what we had. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, another surprise was that um, from after we finished our Philip Hunter interview, uh, sh straight out of nowhere, I don't know, I don't know how, why, but Philip Hunter suggested that we go interview uh, the artist Gary Miles. So that was a really big surprise for us because we weren't ready at all to interview him. We just had to basically pack up all our gear, r rush out to the cars and drive down, um, <laughs> drive down t to his place. So. Yeah, and we're sitting in the car saying, okay, um, tell us about art, you know, basic questions. We, we were so rushed, we couldn't think of anything. Oh yeah, while preparing for the interview. Yeah, yeah we exactly. Didn't, like, I didn't know what to say to him, because <laughs> we didn't know we'd be interviewing him. Yeah, but we thought, you know what, we've got the opportunity, you just have to turn up and see uh, what will come of it. We made the best of it as we could, and that's, that's, what, we, that's what we get. <laughs> Thanks for your honesty, guys. Well, that's it for Working Title 2011. We hope to be back in 2012 with another round of interesting and exciting stories from budding young Victorians. Thank you to all our mentors who have donated their time and energy and thanks to our young and talented filmmakers who have worked so hard. The two films you have just seen will be available online on the Channel 31 and SIN websites. So please, spread the word. Thanks for watching Working Title and good night.